But I like all the U.S. Like, I still like New York. Sure. I still like L.A. I lived there for nine years. Yeah. San Francisco I'm really struggling with. But I, but I like all of the U.S. And I like the mix. And I think, like I said, I think you've got it right here. You can live in a progressive city, but you've got that rapper that stops you going too far. And I just think it's great. I mean, look, you, why do you love it here? You moved here. I mean, part of it's just that I grew up here, right? But it's, Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I was born here, oh. uh, grew up here. Um you know, uh, it's kind of an idyllic place to grow up, honestly. Like, um, it's safe. Uh, you have the University of Texas here, and um, you have a, a lot of, you know, interesting interesting people, right? It's a highly educated, safe place to grow up, right? But at the same time, it is uh, it is kind of a cool place. So if you're into music, well, there are music festivals, and there are people people tour here, right? Um, you're really close to Houston, Dallas. You can get out there to, you know, for the big city life, although that's kind of Austin now. Mm -hmm. It was kind of an idyllic place to grow up. But like for me, more than anything, it's that Austin has like a, a very Texas vibe in terms of like the independent spirit, right? Almost everyone I knew growing up's parents worked for themselves. They had their own businesses. It could have been a restaurant, you know, uh, business. My dad was a, had his own software consultancy business. Like no one seemed to have real jobs. Everyone was independent. Um, at some point, I don't know if this is still true. Even Austin had the highest proportion of independent restaurants of any metropolitan city in the United States. It was all local, right? Austin had its own personality because it wasn't all chain stores, chain restaurants. And, uh, but it also wasn't particularly wealthy when I was growing up, Okay, you know, pre Dell, right. Um, there are no major huge corporations here. Um, so all that independent vibe, we were just working for people in Dallas or, or, you know, consulting for them, stuff like that. But that independent sort of nature of the people, at least I was around in Austin definitely got into my, my blood. Right. And I think actually helped me with Bitcoin later. In fact, it's almost hard for me. Like when you tell your story, it's like, how did anyone in Europe value Bitcoin? If you don't have the same sort of independent or questioning values that you might find in Texas, right? Well, I think it's it's completely different reasons. And I think this yeah. is the reason why Bitcoin has taken off in the US mm -hmm. and hasn't really in Europe. You've, yeah. you've got fringe people, but I think a lot of people first got in for the gains. Yeah. And I think it's only, I think it's only right now that people would maybe really start to question it outside. Look, we have libertarians in Europe, sure, and we have conservatives in Europe, but we don't have. They're not prominent, though. No, well, they're not even necessarily well respected. And it's a different, the it's a different style of conservatism as well. Yeah. in Europe, but now suffering high inflation, weirdness from our governments. I think people mm -hmm. are starting to question it. But it's definitely different. You know, you come for the gains, you stay for the whatever you choose to stay for. Yeah. Um, and I put, it puts us at a disadvantage. Yeah. And there isn't really a significant European Bitcoin scene. There is a European Bitcoin scene, but not significant. We have pockets of people or ideas and some companies, but we don't, like here in Austin and Texas, it feels like it's becoming what, our mutual friend Parker Lewis once is yeah. become the Bitcoin the, capital, the Bitcoin capital of the world. Yeah, because it, I, I can't even put my finger on it. You can probably do it better than me because you're from here. But it just, I've said it before on the show, and people cringe. But it just feels like a very American idea, of Bitcoin, and especially a Texas idea. Well, it's very optimistic, right? Yeah, I don't think it's an accident that it's here in Austin. Um, you know, Austin has a pretty long history in the Bitcoin world. You know, going all the way back to you know. I'm only aware of it from 2011 and forward, but you know the early ASIC miners, you know Cointera, like the first people shipping out uh, machines based here in Austin. A lot of the early mining stuff on um, on GPUs was here in uh, in Austin, also in Florida, obviously. Um, but also, you know, you had uh, the sort of the I don't know. I would credit you know uh, Pierre Richard, Michael Goldstein, Dana Krawitz, the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute guys, their University of Texas. And they really popularize the um, the Austrian view of Bitcoin and, and and treating Bitcoin less as a technology and more as money. And you know, I I could be getting my dates off here a little bit, but that 2013, 2014, 2015, like that narrative wasn't really the predominant narrative 
in Bitcoin at that time until they popularized it. And that started here. I give them a huge amount of credit. And they brought a lot of attention to Austin because of it. Um, but also, like, there was, you know, I say it wasn't accidental. Uh, you know, there's the character of Austin that we talked about before. But it's also that those of us that were participating here from, you know, early days all the way up to now, it was, like, pretty heavy curation, right? Like, we made sure that... Um, we were surrounding ourselves with high integrity people that were in it for the right reasons from our view viewpoint. And, uh, it wasn't always easy. Like Austin could also be like the shitcoin capital of the world. You know, it's like, that's where factum was started. And, um, I bought factum. Did you? Yeah. I bought factum. Poor man. Back in my, I made money on factum. Did you? Back in my shitcoin days. I think so. Yeah. Good for you, I guess. Uh, yeah. But like, you know, at the time it was like, that was the, you know, those guys were really influential here in Austin and we, we had to make a decision. There's all these schisms that happen, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, where we just have to sort of take our ball and go home and just be like, this is, we don't want to surround ourselves with these people. Yeah. And then we'd, you know, shrink back down to like 10 people at my house, you know, talking about Bitcoin. And then, you know, Justin Moon comes in and starts bit devs and all that. But it was, we were constantly going from, you know, 300 people in a room back down to 20, you know, 300 people in a room back down to 20. Now we're, we're back to 300 people in a room, but it's been like kind of brutal curation to make sure that we could surround ourselves with high integrity people. And you're not going back to 20. No, I don't think so. Not now. I think that's another reason I like it here, actually. That's an interesting point, is that uh, when I come here, I, I get to do my work, whatever, but I get to be a Bitcoiner. When I go yeah. home, I'm not a, I don't get to be a Bitcoiner. So I go back to Bedford. Last time I went out, uh, I went back for the weekend, mm -hmm. went out with my four best friends. Like, thinking back, Bitcoin didn't come up once, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we we're watching the rugby. We talked about that. We talked about where we're living, like relationship. We talk about all the stuff. Well, sports. that's good. It doesn't all have to be Bitcoin all yeah, the time. But what I'm saying is, the only time Bitcoin comes up is if my kids ask me anything. It just it there, there's no scene. Or maybe if I'm at the club doing yeah. the football thing, but it doesn't come up. It's it's just not a thing. I I don't have a Bitcoin community. Not only not in Bedford in England. Mm -hmm. I just don't have it. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, whereas I come here and I'm like, cool, I'm going to see Parker, I'm going to see Will, I'm mm -hmm. going to see Justin, I'm going to see Marty, I'm going to see a bunch of people, and we're going to go out to dinner. And by the way, we're not all going to just discuss Bitcoin, we'll discuss other things. Of course. You, you yeah. and I have had long conversations about um, what happened in Ireland. In, yeah. uh, you know, We talk about other things. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. We should bring that up. Yeah, at some point. Yeah, at some point. That's my biggest claim to fame now. Um, but But what I'm saying is I get to like, get into the weeds and challenge myself on some of my ideas. And they have to be challenged because I come from a very different world and very different perspectives. And I get to come here and have that challenge. That's another reason I like it here. And yeah. I, I I do see I I see a world where I end up owning a property here. I yeah. do see that. But you know, that dynamic that you're talking about, that's intelligent design in Austin. It didn't just sporadically happen. And there's a lot of people over a long time, Parker's put it on steroids now. Yeah. You know, like he's really you know, uh, driven this home, but you know, it's been around for a long time, you know, and I give most of the credit to, to Pierre and Michael for like setting the tone in, in Austin. Then Pierre had to take off to New York. Everyone does that in their twenties at some point, but he's back here now. And like, you know, we actively recruit people. Like we shame people for not living here. You know, we, I, uh, we, we give them tours of the city. We buy them cowboy boots. We, we woo them. Right. Because, I don't know. I, everyone talks about Bitcoin citadels and you know all this. It's like, well, we're you know we're not on a pastoral ranch in Wyoming right now, but we have curated this our our own community of people to to be to surround ourselves with, right? And it's very purposeful. And another interesting thing here is uh, on the regulatory side. Yes, on the political side. Yeah, there's it feels like there's almost universal buy-in, and you might tell me something different that I don't know. Yeah. But it does feel like there's a real understanding of why Bitcoin is important, why it's good for Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, got to meet Governor Abbott, which was fascinating. That's awesome. Um, I've observed T Senator Cruz from a distance. Mm -hmm. I know he's not popular with everyone, but he certainly speaks about Bitcoin in an sure. intelligent way. And that's a really important protection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think in Texas, we have... Uh, we have a, a winning strategy for that. I mean, politicians are politicians, right? Like they want to get elected. They want to, and 
being pro Bitcoin right now is a popular thing to do. You you get attention. We'll take get, it. Yeah, you get media. You get all those things. But there's something very real in Texas. I mean, where we're dominating everyone, which is the mining sector, right? The the deregulated grid, the independent grid. Texas has a different yeah. you know grid than the rest of the United States, and um, you know I, I like uh, the way Griffin Haby, you know, out of Houston, talks about this. It's just like you have all these wildcatter mentalities here that are used to you know making huge bets on desert land and poking holes in it, right? And uh, you have this risk-taking mentality, and those people see the value of Bitcoin mining in Texas, and they're a, they're a real political group. You know, that's how people get elected in Texas is around the energy conversation, and Bitcoin's becoming a central point of the energy conversation. Uh, for our grid, for the profitability of some of these huge companies that Texan jobs rely on, what's happening out in Rockdale. Like, there's a reason politicians are doing it. And it's not just because of Twitter, it's because it's actually reshaping the Texas economy. They can see, they do have a vision for that. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's hard to be anti-Bitcoin and be a Texas politician at this point. Well, that energy side itself is super fascinating. We had Sean Connell. Connell, yeah. Do you mm -hmm. know Sean? Yeah. We had, him, we had him on the show the other day, talked to him about it. Uh, he told me a bunch of things that I didn't understand about. I'm still learning, yeah. Dude, some of the things he was telling me I just completely didn't understand about the, the grid. Um, uh, but, but he came on and explained a bunch of things. And one of the things he said is there was like one day recently where 70% of the energy in was it Texas or Austin? In Austin. In Austin came from renewables, which oh, I, yeah. I didn't know that. There's been a massive investment in renewables here, um, which again, I didn't understand. But he was getting into the details of like how the grid works, how you have to have insurance on the grid, say yeah. if something breaks down, that you've got the insurance energy providers are there to, to load into the grid. And he was talking about the role that mining plays in the grid. And it's fucking fascinating because it's you have people like uh, Senator Warren who views uh, energy file as a way to attack Bitcoin, where actually it's, the whole narrative is flipping the complete other way, whereby actually Bitcoin is going to protect the energy sector and protect the grid. Yes. It's like unbelievable. No, it's capitalism, right? Like Warren doesn't get it. It's like you need, like, you don't just get renewable energy for free. You have to invest in it. And so in order to invest in it, it needs to be profitable. In, in order for it to be profitable, it has to be integrated into the grid that we have now. And you need demand in order to build the supply of it. Texas is very unique in that we have this like corridor, you know, up, up there, you know, in the panhandle and everything where we get wind and solar. Like we're the only place where you have everything. You have the natural gas, you have wind, you have solar. You can, you can really make a play where 70% of the energy comes from that. Now, it's not sufficient. You know, you need, you know, on-demand energy like natural gas and, and uh, hydrocarbons in order to actually actually stabilize the grid. But at any given time, we could, in theory, have 70% of the grid going renewables. I think you can go higher. We talked about it with them. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, they, they could, I mean, they should be overbuilding it to 200, 300% capacity. I mean, the way these guys talked last week at our event at the Bitcoin Commons, it blew my mind. You know, we might have, what was it, 70 um, um, gigawatts of uh, energy used uh, or built out in uh, in Texas on the Texas grid right now, and they're talking about building out ten gigawatts just for mining in Texas <laughs> over the next you know five seven years. So is uh, Texas going to become the new China of Bitcoin mining? It is. I mean, all the Chinese miners are coming. I here. know. I know. All of them. Uh, and part of it's just because we already had good infrastructure set up. I mean, they'll end up going to places like Wyoming as well, but Wyoming doesn't have the infrastructure. If you if you need 300 megawatts tomorrow, like you can't do that in Wyoming. You can do that here.